The Ontario Court of Appeal, in considering three privacy cases together, has definitively settled that the privacy tort of intrusion upon seclusion does not apply to a defendant whose information systems were intruded by a malicious third party. This will firmly close the door on a lot of privacy class action claims going forward. Hi, my name is David Fraser. I'm a privacy internet and technology lawyer with the Canadian law firm McGuinness Cooper. I also teach internet and media law at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. In this channel, I try to provide educational and informative content about Canadian privacy and technology law. You should check out the full disclaimer below, but you should know that I'm about to give you a pretty high level overview of a pretty complicated and nuanced subject. Any opinions expressed are mine alone and should not be attributed to my firm or any of its clients. In late November 2022, the Ontario Court of Appeal dropped three important decisions that provide some important clarity about the sorts of legal claims that can successfully be brought against companies that have a security incident resulting in the exposure of personal information. The three cases were heard together with three sets of reasons issued, Winder and Marriott International, Obodo and TransUnion of Canada, and Osaniac and Equifax Canada. Sorry about the pronunciation. In the landmark case of Jones and Siggy, the Ontario Court of Appeal had previously determined that the Prosser privacy torts exist in Ontario common law, including the tort of intrusion upon seclusion. The other privacy torts are public disclosure of private facts, appropriation of a person's name or likeness, and false light publicity. Since the decision in Jones and Siggy, numerous privacy class actions have been brought, many of which have pled the privacy tort of intrusion upon seclusion. The question has been whether this tort can be the basis of liability for a company that is itself a victim of a third party's act. This really turns on the meaning of the word reckless in the articulation of the elements of the cause of action from Jones. Here's what Justice Sharp at the Ontario Court of Appeal said in Jones. Quote, the key features of this cause of action are first, that the defendant's conduct must be intentional, within which I would include reckless. Second, that the defendants must have invaded, without lawful justification, the plaintiff's private affairs or concerns. And third, that a reasonable person would regard the invasion as highly offensive, causing distress, humiliation, or anguish. Plaintiffs in many privacy breach class actions following a hacking incident have argued that the breaches are the result of the defendant's recklessness, usually with respect to the handling or safeguarding of personal information. In the trilogy of decisions from the Ontario Court of Appeal, the most extensive reasons were delivered by Justice Doherty in Oceanic. Sorry. In all three cases, the question before the courts was whether to certify the proposed class actions, which requires that there be at least a legally viable claim. At this stage of the process, all the court is considering is whether the filings by the plaintiff or plaintiffs disclose a reasonable claim based on the facts that they have pled. The court is not deciding who is liable or for how much. The plaintiffs had experienced varied success in the courts below. Now, in its analysis of the intrusion tort, the court, through Justice Doherty, summarized the elements and explicitly categorized the conduct, the state of mind, and the consequences requirements for the intrusion upon seclusion tort. We also need to be very careful about who the defendant is. In this case, the judge is referring to Equifax as the defendant. Quote, the elements of the tort of intrusion upon seclusion are laid down in Jones at paragraph 71. I would describe them as follows. The defendant must have invaded or intruded upon the plaintiff's private affairs or concerns without lawful excuse. The conduct requirement. The conduct which constitutes the intrusion or invasion must have been done intentionally or recklessly. Now that's the state of mind requirement. And a reasonable person would regard the invasion of privacy as highly offensive, causing distress, humiliation, or anguish. And that's the consequence requirement, unquote. For any particular defendant to be liable, that defendant has to have A, done the conduct, B, with the state of mind requirement, and C, the consequences must have followed. The plaintiff was essentially saying to the defendant, Equifax was reckless, which resulted in the intrusion, and that resulted in the consequences, so that Equifax should be legally responsible. In this case, the court disagreed strongly. The state of mind requirement applies to the intruder. Quote, Miss Oceanic's submission misunderstands the relationship between the two elements of the tort. The first element, the conduct requirement, requires an act by the defendant, which amounts to a deliberate intrusion upon or invasion into the plaintiff's privacy. 
The prohibited state of mind, whether intention or recklessness, must exist when the defendant engages in the prohibited conduct. The state of mind must relate to the doing of the prohibited conduct. The defendant must either intend that the conduct which constitutes the intrusion will intrude upon the, the plaintiff's privacy, or the defendant must be reckless that the conduct will have that effect. If the defendant does not engage in conduct that amounts to an invasion of privacy, the defendant's recklessness with respect to the consequences of some other conduct, for example, the storage of the information, cannot fix the defendant with liability for invading the plaintiff's privacy. The court noted that Equifax may be liable to the plaintiff on some other basis, but not as the intruder of the plaintiff's privacy. The court then goes on and says, Equifax's negligent storage of the information cannot in law amount to an invasion of or an intrusion upon the plaintiff's privacy interests in the information. Equifax's recklessness as to the consequences of its negligent storage cannot make Equifax liable for the intentional invasion of the plaintiff's privacy committed by the independent third-party hacker. Equifax's liability, if any, lies in its breach of a duty owed to the plaintiffs or its breach of contractual or statutory obligations." Unquote. The plaintiff said that if their first argument did not prevail, the tort of intrusion upon seclusion should be extended by the Court of Appeal to apply to the database defendants. Otherwise, they said the plaintiffs would be without a remedy in the circumstances. Now, this line of thinking was dismissed by the Court of Appeal, which said, quote, the plaintiff's no remedy argument really comes down to the assertion that because the remedies available in contract and negligence require proof of pecuniary loss, the plaintiffs who cannot prove pecuniary loss are left with no remedy. With respect, that is not what the court meant in Jones when it described the plaintiff as being without a remedy. The plaintiffs here are in the same position as anyone else who advances the kind of claim the plaintiffs have advanced here. Because the claim sounds in negligence and contract, the plaintiffs must prove pecuniary loss. The plaintiff's position is miles away from the predicament faced by the plaintiff in Jones, unquote. The court then goes on to say, quote, while it cannot be said the plaintiffs are left without a remedy, it is true that the inability to claim moral damages may have a negative impact on the plaintiff's ability to certify the claim as a class proceeding. In my view, that procedural consequence does not constitute the absence of a remedy. Procedural advantages are not remedies. Unquote. The court finally noted before dismissing the appeal that if Parliament or the provincial legislatures wanted to extend the law so far as to provide moral damages in case like, cases like this, they are certainly able to do so. And there still are legal claims that can be made in hacking cases. Even if we strike intrusion upon seclusion off the list, there is still negligence, breach of contract, breach of a statutory duty, and breach of confidence. None of these are very easy to make out, however, and the breach of confidence may also be struck off the list because it requires some misuse of the data by the defendant. We will see where all this goes, since hacking cases are not going away at all. I hope this has been interesting and useful. I try to put out a new video each other week or so, so if you're interested in this sort of content, please click the like and subscribe buttons. Also, leave a comment if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for other topics to cover. And of course, feel free to share this with anyone who you think may be interested in hearing about developments in Canadian tech and privacy law. Thanks for tuning in.